the optic nerve head. And the next picture is a glaucomatous cupped nerve. And this is important because there are many other optic neuropathies, but most of them cause pallor of the optic nerve, not cupping. Why glaucoma cups and other diseases lead to paleness and not, and not cupping is really unclear. This is a histologic specimen of a healthy nerve on the left and a glaucomatous nerve on the right. So I think in cross-section you can see that the normal nerve has a slight depression. That's where the axons of the ganglion cells come together to make up the optic nerve. So we all have some cup to our optic nerve. But a patient who has glaucoma and has lost these ganglion cells and the axons have died off, the nerve becomes significantly cupped and, in fact, looks somewhat like a bean pot, and we often describe it that way clinically. Because of the orientation of the axons of the ganglion cells, glaucomatous visual field defects have a very characteristic appearance. They usually break at the horizontal midline. This helps us distinguish glaucomatous visual field defects from other visual field defects. So this is a visual field of a patient with glaucoma. This is their right eye, and this patient has a superior arcuate defect. Interestingly, this patient may be completely unaware of this defect, even though it looks quite severe, because we don't tend to use our superior visual fields as much as our inferior visual fields. So this can explain why often patients with glaucoma don't know they have the disease until quite late, as we see with our illustration of Mr. M. So to put this in perspective of other diseases that cause visual impairment, cataract is our leading cause of visual impairment worldwide. There's a picture of a patient with a cataract here. Um, that's a very dense cataract. We don't tend to see them this white anymore. But cataracts generally cause a diffuse blurring of the vision. Everything's blurry. Patients say they can't see to read, they can't see to drive, everything's blurry. When a cataract gets quite advanced. Macular degeneration, on the other hand, causes changes in the center part of the retina or the macula, which can be scarring or can be neovascularization, and that tends to lead to a central scotoma. So macular degeneration can be devastating in that patients may lose the ability to read or recognize faces to drive, but they almost always retain their peripheral vision. So a patient may be legally blind from macular degeneration but not walking around with a cane because they can actually ambulate without bumping into things because they've got intact peripheral vision. They can usually live independently, dress themselves. This is a, different from a patient with advanced glaucoma because glaucoma tends to cause peripheral vision loss first until very late in the disease when it affects central acuity. So a patient with glaucoma might be the one using a cane to get around because otherwise they'd be bumping into everything. And patients with advanced glaucoma can actually be legally blind due to the dense visual field construction, yet still measure 20-20 on the chart because through that little tiny island in the middle, their vision is actually quite clear. Glaucoma is one of the few diseases that can lead not only to legal blindness, which is worse than 2200 in the better eye, but actual no light perception vision, so complete blindness. There are just not that many eye diseases that do that. So I said there are probably a lot of different diseases that we lump together and call glaucoma. Well, the, the two broad categories are open angle and closed angle glaucoma. Open angle glaucoma, the anterior segment of the eye looks normal. It looks like the ciliary body is making aqueous. The aqueous is passing through the pupil into the anterior chamber and getting to the angle where the trabecular meshwork is located that drains the aqueous fluid. This all looks like it should be working just fine, yet they still have glaucoma. In narrow or closed angle glaucoma, it's obvious from our physical exam that something's not right. And often these are folks who are naturally farsighted, so have a little bit shorter eyes than people who are nearsighted or, or emetropic. And then with time and age, as the lens of the eye gets thicker, as it does with all of us, the lens eventually pushes the iris forward enough that it blocks off that angle and that internal drain of the eye. The fluid can no longer get to the trabecular meshwork, and the pressure can go very high in the eye. So in patients who have an attack of uh, acute or narrow or closed angle glaucoma, they tend to experience a sudden and very dramatic increase in their intraocular pressure, often associated with pain, nausea, vomiting, decreased vision. So this is a very different presentation than someone who has open angle glaucoma that's indolent and slowly losing vision over years. Because closed angle glaucoma is more of a mechanical problem, we have more of a mechanical solution to it. We make a hole in the iris called an iridectomy. We can do that surgically or most often now with a laser. 
and that hole allows the fluid that's made by the ciliary body to pass through the opening in the iris to the angle in the trabecular mesh work and drain out of the eye so that the pressure doesn't go terribly high in the eye. We often do this prophylactically if we examine someone and we think it looks like they're at risk for this disease because we'd much rather catch it before it happens. So this is what that looks like, a patient who's had a small hole made in the iris with a laser. Usually this is going to be covered up by the eyelid, but we're lifting the eyelid here to show it. That's called a peripheral iridotomy. So that is primary closed angle glaucoma. There are also secondary forms of closed angle glaucoma. Any of you who take care of patients with diabetes are probably familiar with rubiosis of the iris or neovascularization of the iris. This usually starts off right at the pupillary margin and can be quite subtle, like in this picture but it can advance to florid rubiosis as well that takes over the whole iris. And even before it gets to this point, these abnormal blood vessels can creep into the angle and form a membrane over the angle that re results in a secondary closed angle form of glaucoma. There are also secondary forms of open angle glaucoma where the angle is anatomically open, but there's something blocking the outflow of the aqueous humor. This is a really interesting disease called pseudoexfoliation, which uh, is a condition in which there's a basement membrane-like material that's distributed on epithelial surfaces throughout the body, even the heart. And that's the only reference I could come up with for the heart within a group. I know a lot of cardiologists. <laughs> but apparently it doesn't cause problems anywhere except for in the eye. But it can cause a really intractable form of open angle glaucoma. And this is that fluffy gray material you see on the lens of a patient who's had cataract surgery here. Trauma can also lead to a secondary open angle glaucoma. Blunt trauma to the eye can cause a very typical rosette appearing cataract, and that's what we're showing here in this photo. Also can damage the outflow facility of the eye and lead to glaucoma even 10, 20, 30 years later after the trauma. But most of the time when we talk about glaucoma, most of the patients that I take care for have primary open angle glaucoma. That is, the angle looks open, and I don't have any explanation for why this is happening other than their risk factors that they have. And those risk factors include increased age, family history of glaucoma, African American or Latino heritage, and elevated intraocular pressure. And this is important because a lot of people think that pressure is synonymous with glaucoma, and a lot of ophthalmologists thought that for many years. But we've more recently learned that probably a third of people with primary open angle glaucoma have never had a documented pressure above 21, which is usually thought to be the upper end of normal. So you can certainly have glaucoma and not have high pressure. We learned this uh, in the early 90s from some of the population-based studies that were done. This is the Baltimore Eye Survey, which included more than 5,000 uh, participants in the Baltimore area. They all had eye exams done in neighborhood-based clinics and found that um, the patients here, here I think we have plotted the cumulative distribution of the intraocular pressure in the glaucomatous eyes and the non-glaucomatous eyes. And I think you can see that in the glaucomatous eyes, the pressures are skewed, skewed to a higher number. But still, 50% of the glaucomatous eyes have pressure reading 20 or below at the baseline exam. So pressure is important, but is not a great screening tool for us for glaucoma. From studies like this one, the Baltimore Eye Survey, as well as other population-based studies, we learned the prevalence of glaucoma in the United States is about 2% for Americans over 40 years of age. But that increases dramatically with age and um, by ethnicity and race as well. So African Americans over age 70 have closer to a 10% prevalence of glaucoma very significant. And overall, the age-adjusted prevalence for African Americans is three times that of white Americans for glaucoma. We also learned from some of these population-based studies that half of the patients who were found to have glaucomatous optic nerve head damage on exam didn't know that they had glaucoma. Unfortunately, we've learned from other studies that many of these patients who didn't know that they had glaucoma, had actually seen eye care providers in the past 12 months. The study was done in Australia, but I think the results would be very similar in the U.S. So there's a lot of room for improvement, both in our diagnosis of a glaucoma, our provider level education as well. And why is that? Well, it's a difficult disease to diagnose. It's still a clinical diagnosis and very slowly progressive. So I'll try to illustrate that in these 
photos of the optic nerve head of a patient taken from 2005 through 2010. Optic nerves can look funny just the way they were made. When people were born, the optic nerves look funny, and that's okay. But if they're changing over time, that's what gives us uh, insight that there might be glaucoma progressing. And I think I can probably convince you that the optic nerve in this patient 2005 looks a little different than it does in 2010. To my view, there is thinning of the neuroretinal rim down here infrotemporally compared to 2005, but that's really difficult to pick up between 2005 and 2006 and 2006 and 2007. It's a slowly progressive disease. And the patient over this time period might experience a very small visual field defect called a nasal step, which is completely unnoticeable to the patient and only picked up by our automated testing. But that progresses over years if untreated. And once this visual field defect starts to encroach on fixation, it does become more bothersome to the patient usually. So what causes primary open angle glaucoma? We don't know. But there does seem to be a genetic predisposition. Aging effects play an important role. Perhaps there's a combination of a susceptible optic nerve and poor aqueous humor dynamics brought on with age that lead to this disease. Regardless, the only treatment that's ever been proven to be effective to reduce vision loss from glaucoma is lowering the intraocular pressure. We've looked at exercise and diet, different lifestyle issues, but the only thing that works is lowering the pressure as far as we can tell so far. Even if it was in the normal range to start, so even those folks who didn't have technically high pressure when they were diagnosed. There were several important trials that helped teach us this. Um, the first one being the early manifest glaucoma trial conducted in Europe in which patients with early glaucoma were randomized to observation or to treatment. And patients who were treated had less visual field loss over the ensuing months. So how low do we need to get the pressure? That's still a bit of a mystery and it seems to be different for every patient. Patients with advanced disease probably need a much lower pressure than patients who don't have advanced disease. The advanced glaucoma intervention study in which all the patients had quite severe disease, the patients who always had an intraocular pressure lower than 14 on each clinic visit had less progression, no net visual field defect progression over the course of the study, although some of the patients got worse and some got a little bit better. So how can we lower the pressure? Well, both medications and surgery can be effective at doing that. The collaborative initial glaucoma treatment study randomized patients to initial surgery or initial medication and found that both were very good at lowering intraocular pressure and both, both were very good at preserving visual field. There were more side effects with the surgery though. So in most cases we start with either topical eye drops um, or laser treatment which is considered non-invasive before going to incisional surgery. These are the options we have available to us. Um, mostly topical eye drops. There are some systemic medications that lower intraocular pressure but aren't used as commonly for their side effects. Laser trabeculoplasty is a little different than the laser I described earlier for the iris and it can lower the intraocular pressure about as well as one drop. It's not very dramatic but it can be helpful. There are also some more um, uh, destructive type laser procedures which can get the pressure much lower but have unpleasant side effects. And then there's incisional surgery and these have been around for a long time, trabeculectomy and aqueous shunts. Laser trabeculoplasty is getting to be more and more common um, because I think we're all starting to recognize some of the issues with medication adherence and side effects from glaucoma drops. As I said, laser trabeculoplasty works quite well. It just doesn't last forever um, and it is not terribly dramatic. So it can't replace eye drops for someone who's on three different medications, but it might replace one. Trabeculectomy surgery is an incisional surgery which can be very effective at getting the pressure low. In fact, it can get patients off of drops completely. And this is a surgeon's view of a trabeculectomy where a partial thickness scleral flap has been created and the surgeon is passing a suture through to create a guarded filter so that the aqueous humor in the anterior chamber will pass through that filter and out into the conjunctiva. This is a slit lamp view of the same patient and that fluid creates a bleb or a blister underneath the conjunctiva of fluid which is then drained by the thin vessels that run through the conjunctiva. This can be very effective, but as you might imagine from looking at this, um, we've created a fistula, so there is a lifetime risk of infection from this type of surgery. And that bleb can be really irritating when you have to blink over it many times every day. Also, the blebs are 
prone to scarring down. That's the biggest reason for failure for these. We've essentially created a fistula that we want to stay open forever, and the body does not want that to stay open forever. So um, scarring is really our enemy with trabeculectomy surgery. And because of that, um, about 20 years ago, there was the introduction of aqueous shunts, which are implants that essentially perform the same function. There's an example of an Ahmed implant on the top and a bare belt implant below. So these implants are put in much in the same way that trabeculectomy surgery is performed, tucked um, up underneath the eyelid, and then there's a little tube that's placed into the anterior chamber. These can work really well, but they don't get the pressure as low as trabeculectomy. So some of our patients have actually had multiple tubes placed. This patient's got three tubes in the eye. And these are foreign bodies, so they're prone to exposure. Uh, and that's a long-term risk that we have to deal with in patients who've had glaucoma implants. So this is a glaucoma plate that's become exposed. And then every now and then something really wacky will happen, like a suture will migrate into the anterior chamber. Yeah, that's a big floater, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Big, long, skinny floater. Um, so most of the time we start with eye drops. And for many patients, this is all they need for their lifetime. The eye drops that we use to treat glaucoma um, do one of two things, and sometimes a little bit of both. They either decrease the aqueous production or they increase the aqueous outflow. And the drugs that decrease aqueous production include the beta blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and alpha agonists. The drugs that increase outflow include pilocarpine, which was the only drug we had for many years and has a lot of unpleasant side effects. We don't use it as much anymore, but occasionally. And then the prostaglandin analogs are the newest type of um, medications for glaucoma, even though they're not that new anymore. Um, and they also increase uh, outflow through the uveoscleral pathway. So we have treatment for glaucoma, and we know that lowering the intraocular pressure does reduce the risk of vision loss. Yet we still have patients losing vision from glaucoma. The Mayo Group looked at the Olmsted County data many years ago and found that in their estimates, more than 20% of patients in their cohort lost vision in at least one eye, progressed to legal blindness in, in one eye over the course of 20 years. Now, this data was from mostly the, the 80s and looked at in the, in the late 90s, when really all we had available was pilocarpine. And these are all treated patients, recognized and treated patients. The same um, Mayo group, group looked at their data more recently, and we've gotten better. Um, so. It's better than 20% now, but it's still more than 10% of patients with treated glaucoma are going blind in one eye by visual field or visual acuity criteria. So why is this? I think there are probably lots of different reasons. Some people have more aggressive disease than others. But the reason that interests me the most that I think we can do something about is improving the way patients take their eye drops. And taking eye drops is challenging. When we prescribe glaucoma drops for patients, we're generally asking them to do this every day for the rest of their lives, often multiple times a day. And this can go wrong in a lot of ways. Patients can use too many drops and run out of the bottle by the end of the month and then have a gap in their therapy of a week at the end of every month. This can re result in long-term pressure fluctuation. Patients can dose late in the day. If they're on a drop, it has to be taken two or three times a day. Or they can miss the eye entirely, and this is all too common, and that can result in short-term pressure fluctuation, both of which we think are uh, risk factors for progression, particularly in advanced disease. And many of you who take care of patients with chronic diseases are very aware that uh, medication adherence is poor in these chronic asymptomatic diseases for a variety of reasons, and it's very similar for glaucoma. The rates of adherence range from 10 to 83 percent, depending on how you define it and how it's measured. For example, in a study of 2,000 patients, 65 and older, nearly a quarter didn't fill the prescription at all. And the average number of days without medication over the course of a year was 112. And importantly, many patients can't get the drop in their eyes. Um, Dr. Robin really described this best um, a few years ago. There have been several follow-up studies. but. Even though patients report to us often that they're able to use drops without problems under observation in his study, only a third were able to actually instill the drop into their eye successfully. So of the different dimensions of medication adherence described by the World Health Organization, glaucoma patients have reported problems that fall into all of these categories, including the cost of the medication, side effects, visual field defects limiting their ability to get the drop into the eye, 
frequent dosing, number of medications. And the one that became most interesting to me when I was just finishing my training as a fellow was poor health literacy. Because I looked at all these problems why people can't take their glaucoma drops and why my patients were not taking their glaucoma drops and thought, I can't do anything about a lot of these things. But if there is something I can treat or something I can reduce the barrier of, it might be poor health literacy. For anybody who's not familiar with this concept, I was not when I started looking at it. Health literacy refers to the idea of how people process verbal and written information in a healthcare setting. So the idea is that literacy is not just black and white. It's not either you can read or you can't, but you may be able to read, but not able to fully act on that information in a healthcare situation. The first large study of health literacy in the United States was in 2003 and found that a third of adult Americans were functioning at a below basic or basic uh, health literacy level. So this includes things like not being able to read an appointment reminder about when their next appointment was or not being able to accurately report when their medications were going to expire. So it's more than just words, it's numbers as well. Around this time, there were a lot of studies of health literacy, several reporting that patients with poor health literacy were more likely to be hospitalized. And even when controlling for baseline health status, patients with poor health literacy had higher mortality than their more literate peers. So I felt like my patients were probably at great risk for poor health literacy, uh, given the age group that um, tends to have glaucoma and uh, age greater than 65 is a risk factor for poor health literacy. So we started looking at this in glaucoma patients. And we found that, not surprisingly, our patients who had poor literacy were less likely to take their medications as prescribed. Colleagues in Detroit found that patients were more likely to present with advanced visual field loss if they had poor literacy. We found they had worse vision-related quality of life compared to more literate peers. And then when we looked at our education materials available for patients about glaucoma, most of them were written at at least a high school, if not a college reading level. And then I'm sure you're all aware research consent forms are, no matter what it says, you're supposed to put the reading level out. If you just include the verbatim language you have to include, you're already at a very high reading level. And this is a problem for the whole family. Um, fortunately, childhood glaucoma is not very common, but we have a world expert at our, our center, so we do some studies with her families, and we found that children of parents with poor health literacy were less adherent to their glaucoma medications. So with this information, we did a study at the Durham VA where we enrolled veterans with medically treated glaucoma and tested their health literacy status at the onset of the study. And then we grouped them into inadequate, marginal, and adequate literacy levels. And then within each group, randomized patients to a literacy level appropriate educational intervention versus standard care. We had 127 veterans. It was a pretty typical demographic for folks with glaucoma. And they had a relatively high burden of disease. Most people were on at least two eye drops. We found that although in our intervention group, patients had less days without medicine, which was the adherence measure we used following the intervention from the pharmacy refill information available at the VA, than patients in the standard care group within each grouping of literacy. The results were not significant. It was small numbers in each group. But we did find an increasing effect size with decreasing literacy levels. So our interventions seemed to have more of an impact on the less, less literate patients. So this told me that there was at least a population out there who was vulnerable and who might be responsive to an intervention and folks that we could help. So the first thing we had to do was develop some materials because there really wasn't anything out there available for our less literate patients. The next thing we needed to do was try to decide how we're going to measure adherence in glaucoma. Because we don't have a biologic metabolite in the blood we can measure to tell if our patients are taking their medication or not. We can't even do a pill count. It's hard to know how many drops are left in the bottle. So we're a little bit limited in knowing how our patients are doing with their medications. Um, probably the most common way clinicians address this is just by self-report. How are you doing? But that's notoriously inaccurate, unfortunately. Um, there are electronic monitors available, and I'll talk a little bit about those. They're nice, but they're expensive, and they don't work for everything. Uh, pharmacy records are helpful, particularly in a closed pharmacy system like the VA when it comes to assessing adherence, um, but it's difficult to use outside of the VA. And then 
without glaucoma drops, we need to know if patients can get their drops into their eyes or not, because none of these measures tell us whether the drop is actually getting into the eye. And the only way we can do that is by direct observation. So we started an observational study with a Duke site and a VA site enrolling patients with medically treated glaucoma. And we measured their adherence in a variety of ways, including electronic monitors, direct observation of eye drop technique, a validated survey that we developed with a group from UNC of self-efficacy with eye drop administration, and then the pharmacy refill information from the VA pharmacy. From the pharmacy refill information, we calculated a medication possession ratio. So we had 137 participants, um, again, a pretty typical demographic group for people with open angle glaucoma. Probably the most striking thing to me from this uh, initial baseline information from the study was that about 10% of the patients could not actually get the drop in their eye when they were observed. And this was very humbling because many of these were my patients and people who I had been adding another medication because the, their pressure was not adequately controlled when in fact they actually couldn't get the drop in their eyes. So that was very humbling. And then even more than that, couldn't actually do it with only one drop. So there's not a whole lot of excess in those bottles. So if it takes you two or three drops to get one in, you're going to run out before the end of the month. There's no way around it. Interestingly, we found no relationship between our battery of self-report questions about how patients put their drops into their eyes and whether or not they could do it under observation. So I think there's no substitute for watching a patient try to put their drop in and seeing if they can do it. There's no question we can ask that's necessarily going to elicit that information for us. According to the electronic monitors, our patients took more than 80% of the prescribed doses, which is pretty good compared to some of the reported averages. Less, though, took their medications on schedule as, as advised, about 60%. That's also pretty common if you look at the literature. Surprisingly, when we looked at medication possession ratio for our VA participants, we weren't able to do that for the Duke participants because Medco was really difficult to work with. The, um, our patients, on average, had more medication than they needed. Um, in fact, 150% of their prescribed doses in their possession according to the refill information. This was surprising to me, so we looked at it a lot of different ways um, and never came up with a great explanation for it. Um, it did not relate significantly with electronically monitored adherence, though. So in general, patients who had higher medication possession ratios did have higher adherence, but the relationship was not statistically significant. So this somewhat discouraged me from using medication possession ratio as a outcome measure for adherence in future studies of interventions to improve adherence, at least over a short period of time. And this was about six months that we looked at. I was also interesting, interested in developing screening items to find out who is poorly adherent so that when we do test interventions, we can intervene on those who need it the most. And there was a combination of two questions that was particularly helpful of the many questions we asked our patients. Patients who responded that they were very confident that they always remembered to take their medications and that no, they had not forgotten to take their medications in the past four weeks were more likely to demonstrate at least 80% adherence with the electronic monitors with an odds ratio of 2.6. So in our ongoing pilot study, we're using these two questions to screen over the phone for poorly adherent patients before we try to test our intervention in them. So from this observational study, I think we got an idea of how we could perhaps screen for poor adherence. We developed some guidelines about what type of outcome measures would be appropriate to use as we try to improve adherence. But then we really had to focus on what the content of that intervention would be. And because of the realization that so many of our patients could not actually put the eye drops in their eyes despite having been on prescription glaucoma medications for years, we explored different assistive devices. And there are several that are available through the VA, some that help patients squeeze the bottle, some that help patients guide the drop which is really important for our older patients with osteoarthritis and tremor. And then we've actually worked with a group in RTP to develop a new bottle. We have a, a small um, SBIR grant to do this so the patients don't have to lean their head backs. Even though there are a lot of different eye drop aids available, all of them require patients to recline their head and invert the bottle. And for patients with a lot of neck arthritis, that can be really difficult. So we're working on a bottle where patients can plug the bottle in the top, 
squeeze the lever and dispense the drop directly into the eye. So that's been a lot of fun to test in patients. So in the process of trying to develop this intervention for folks with um, poor glaucoma medication adherence, I was lucky to get to collaborate with a colleague at UNC who had a, um, an R01 funded by the National Eye Institute to study glaucoma um, and patient provider communication with relation to adherence. So Betsy Sleep is um, in the Eshelman School of Pharmacy at UNC, and the purpose of her study is to describe different elements of the relationship, the communication between providers and patients with attention to better or worse glaucoma outcomes and adherence. We enrolled adult glaucoma patients at six sites in four states. We were a site at Duke. And all of our video, uh, all of our clinic visits were recorded. So the first few papers out of this study were um, valuable but, but depressing because it showed that we are horrible at talking to our patients about glaucoma. Uh, it was really humbling to realize how little we actually, how little time we actually spend educating patients about glaucoma, educating patients about how to put their eye drops in. So I'm really glad we were able to report that information, but it really was humbling. Um, so I'm, I'm particularly excited about this most recent paper that is out because it showed that even though we don't do it enough, when we do talk to our patients about how to administer their glaucoma drops, it makes a difference. So patients who received education from their physician specifically about how to administer their drops were more likely to take at least 80% of the doses in the six months, no, I think 60 days it was, following the intervention. Not the intervention, it was just observational, following that baseline visit in which that conversation happened. So with this information and then with a lot of the work that um, my VA mentor um, Hayden Bosworth has done with medication adherence and chronic disease with mobile health technologies, we've developed an intervention that includes specific eye drop aids, specific teaching materials, and then also automated reminder devices like this new one from Adherent Tech, which notifies patients by text or voicemail message when they haven't opened the bottle within two hours of their prescribed dosing interval. So getting back to our patient, Mr. M. So as we determined in the beginning, unfortunately he has advanced glaucoma. He was started on a monocular trial of latanoprost with the target pressure around 12. Sequentially added multiple medications to try to get him to that target pressure but weren't able to get there. So ultimately he underwent combined cataract and trabeculectomy surgery. Trabeculectomy causes cataracts. So we often do them combined procedures. So in subsequent years, his vision loss has stabilized. We can't get back what he lost, though. So he is, he's lost his central acuity in the right eye due to the visual field defect involving fixation, and he has significant limitation in the left eye. So while we do have procedures that can potentially stabilize disease in the late stage, we can do better than this. And this patient was diagnosed and treated 10 years ago. Um, but wasn't able to sustain his therapy and doesn't have to be in this position if we could make intervention happen earlier and be effective. So that's it. Oh, good. I came in better time than I thought. So I, I'm very lucky to work with a great um, group of colleagues at the Duke Eye Center, the glaucoma faculty, um, residents and fellows mentioned here, um, as well as the Durham VA and my mentors on the VA Career Development Award, Hayden Bosworth and Gino Donny, also have excellent colleagues at UNC and Betsy Sleeth and up at Michigan and Paul Lee and Alan Robin in Baltimore. And I um, was fortunate enough to train under the late, great David Epstein, uh, who inspired us all to be inquisitive clinicians. So happy to take any questions. Yes. Yeah, so I'm interested in, in and yes. the ability to uh, improve the delivery. Yes. And uh, and so I think you're going to go about trying to demonstrate that. You know, obviously in a clinical trial setting. Right. You know, um, eye drops versus your your new device. <coughs> Um, type of thing. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and how do you see that unfolding in the, in the future? Yeah, that, that project has been a lot of fun. I, I've glossed over it and, and, and shouldn't because it, it's been such an interesting part of my 
training and career. It was actually Dr. Epstein's idea more than 20 years ago to develop an eye drop bottle that could be used upright with the head upright. And in the early days, we actually had a lab in the Duke Eye Center of biomedical engineers who worked in the eye center creating new instruments for the OR. And they created the first two iterations of this bottle. And it had an entirely different design back then. It was a dipstick design. Um, and we tested it in patients just compared to a standard eye drop bottle. And we had a protocol of asking patients to use one, eye, one bottle than the other bottle. And we randomized which one they used first and whether they were right-handed or left-handed. And we had greater score whether they could get the drop in their eye with either bottle and how, in time how long it took and whether they wasted any drops in the process and whether they contaminated the bottle tip. And then this is, I believe, the fourth iteration of the bottle, um, which came about after Dr. Epstein um, connected with a small biotech company in RTP called Galero, who just does this. They make niche products for medical devices, and they have a lot of expertise in plastics, and that's what we really needed. So the new bottle is totally different design than the old one. It's more of a, a piston design than the dipstick function, and it propels a drop out of the, out of the bottle into the eye, which. I wasn't sure it could be done. Um, it had been tried with sprays for many years, but the blink reflex is so strong that that never worked very well. Um, but this one really works. So right now we're just enrolling 40 patients, a small group, but we've only got 40 devices, um, and having them use a standard bottle and the, tr and the newer bottle, doing all the same measurements we've done in the past, timing how they do, and then collecting qualitative information about how they like it. Because there'll probably be a fifth iteration, and maybe a sixth iteration before we get down the road to where we want to be. It's a lot of fun. So there, there are other interesting technologies out there. You know, uh, Google has this lens, which they uh, signed over to Novartis and their big eye care uh, uh, sub, you know, subdivision, Albion. And, and so uh, one of the things about the Google lens is that it can measure different analytes. What they're targeting is glucose. But yeah. if you read their patent, it's got more than just glucose. It's got all sorts of analytes. Right. And, and, and their thought is, you know, drugs. Right. And, and so is, is that another technology that can help you figure out compliance? You know, are you, are you actually getting the, the medication onto the eye? Right. And so it's sitting there right on the surface of the cornea. And so this little uh, Google lens can potentially do that. And so do you think there's a future for something like that in glaucoma care since medication seems to be a very significant problem in, in caring for this disease. It does. I, I, I think definitely. I think sustained release drug delivery devices for glaucoma are um, uh, needed and have been worked on for years and certainly a, a contact lens um, device is a possibility. Years ago there was a dissolvable collagen lens that held pilocarpine. And there is now in trials uh, punctal plugs, so we all have little uh, tear puncta that, that drain our tears that you can, can be impregnated with latanoprost and plugged in to release drug over the long term. Um, I have a colleague who's working on a novel device that will allow clinicians to inject um, drug into Schlem's canal, which is the more distal part of the outflow pathway. Um, so far, there hasn't been a lot of success with any of these different devices because of the ocular toxicities of some of the medications, and particularly, I think, a, a contact lens and the corneal toxicity of that might be too much. Um, and the cornea is avascular and very sensitive um, to um, epithelial um, defects and, and erosions affecting quality of vision. So things that stay away from the cornea tend to work better um, when for um, sustained release medications, but we definitely need that. I think there's a, a lot of room for improvement out there. Our colleagues in retina have been much more successful at developing sustained release drugs for the back of the eye because it's a really nice protected space back there. Um, our anterior segment is not quite as protected. Everything drains out and the lens and cornea are more sensitive to, to damage as avascular tissues that need to be clear. Long-winded answer, but I think it's a great idea. And, I, and I've heard some about this and the idea that there might be some type of biomarkers in the tear film that would be helpful for diagnosing disease. Um, we haven't yet found any biomarkers for glaucoma specifically, but we're looking. What I would love to see, and I think where a contact lens really could be important, is we don't have any type of 
hemoglobin and A1C for the eye pressure. We don't have um, home blood pressure monitoring or a Holter monitor. We just have the pressure we check in clinic and that's it. Um, and there is a contact lens device out there that is being in trials apparently to help give us intraocular pressure measurements <coughs> continuously, at least for a period of time until right. the lens becomes too irritating to wear anymore, but that'll be more than we have right now. Um, the best we can do, and this is very crude, is bring patients into clinic and check their pressure every hour for a day and just see how much diurnal fluctuation they have. Other than uh, uh, medications, is there any type of solidified research uh, documented uh, towards the, uh, the pressures and, and how you can actually reduce those pressures other than medications such as diet, lifestyle yeah. situations? I didn't know if there was any anything documented. Not a lot, lots of studies, nothing's panned out is the, is the short answer. Um, there are a lot of things that temporarily reduce the pressure. Sleeping, uh, your pressure is lower while you sleep. Um, and, and that's helpful. Um, exercise, cardiovascular exercise while you're doing it lowers the pressure. Um, alcohol lowers the pressure. Any diuretic does, basically. Um, but it's not a sustained effect and has not been shown to correlate with clinical outcomes. So right now there's nothing we can legitimately describe to patients. Um, there's certain there are no, things that are known to elevate the pressure too. Standing on your head, <laughs> playing wind instruments, anything that causes a valsalva maneuver elevates the pressure. But without a good correlation to clinical outcomes, I don't tell my patients not to play wind instruments. I don't think that that's going to help their quality of life if I can't say for certain that it's, it's a problem. But I do have colleagues who, in severe glaucoma, will tell patients not, not to play wind instruments. So it's a bit controversial, but nothing's been proven. Well, good. Uh, well, please join me in thanking Dr. Muir. And uh, remember, it's glaucoma awareness.